I first met John, or Bulldog, as all of his good friends call him, <laughs> in 1999 when I became a correspondent on The Daily Show. It was a dream job. I share an office with my friend Stephen Colbert. I traveled the country doing field reports about interesting and eccentric people. I worked with an incredibly talented production team, and above all else, I had front row seats to witness the magic of Jon Stewart. It is impossible to exaggerate the amount of physical and mental effort that went into making The Daily Show. And John carried the bulk of that work on his sinewy, narrow shoulders. <laughs> he was our leader, and we would do anything for him. One of my first assignments was an interview with a man who ran a venom research facility in Nebraska. <laughs> when I got there, the research facility was actually a mobile home full of snakes. <laughs> Some in cages, some free-range. <laughs> the scientist who ran the facility had been bitten by his snakes so many times that the hospital wouldn't send an ambulance all the way out to his home anymore. It was terrifying, as I have a phobia of things that can kill me. <laughs> Fortunately, I managed to not get bitten or squeezed to death. John loved the interview. As he watched it, he jokingly said over and over that it would have been great if I'd actually been bitten by a snake. <laughs> I remember him saying, quote, that would have been great if you'd been bitten by one of those snakes. I would have loved that. That would have been so funny. <laughs> Do you remember that, John? <laughs> I do remember. So John Stewart changed my life. In 2010, I was co-hosting a show on a video game network when I got a call that John Stewart wanted to interview me. So I went to the Daily Show studio located in the heart of New York City, 52nd and 11th. <laughs> it was technically in the river, do you remember? I met John in his office that day and I was amazed. His office, no exaggeration, um, was a garbage can. <laughs> it was a mess. There was actual trash in it. Like anything free he had ever been given, he just put on his desk. And then there was a treadmill in the corner of his office, and the treadmill had clothes on it. I could describe it more, but then I would just be naming garbage. <laughs> so I start getting nervous. I'm like, oh, is this why he wants to hire an Asian American woman to help organize? <laughs> But honestly, we had an amazing conversation that day, the first of many, and then he offered me a job as a correspondent, and it was incredible. So on my way out of his office, I, I see this, this gold glowing light coming from behind the door, and then I see on the ground, there's this cardboard box filled with Emmy Awards. They were just like haphazardly thrown in there. So I said, are these your actual Emmy Awards? And he said, yeah, that's where I keep them. <laughs> Look, some people might put their Emmys on a shelf or behind glass, but not Jon Stewart. His are in a cardboard box shoved behind a door. Because that's who he is. Lazy and vaguely disrespectful. Another time, Jon sent Stephen and I out to do a report about the effects of alcohol on motor skills. In a loosely controlled experiment, I drank six Long Island iced teas in the course of about 45 minutes while Stephen tested my cognitive abilities. On the way home, I threw up out the window of Stephen's car. Unfortunately, the window was closed. John loved that I had pushed the envelope that I had jeopardized my personal health and well-being for the sake of a two-minute comedy sketch. He asked if there was any extended footage of the vomiting. There wasn't. He also reiterated that he'd like to see me bitten by a snake at some point. John was always supporting us, always cheering us on from the comfort and safety of his office. He once had me eat Crisco on camera. 
It could have been vanilla frosting because that looks exactly the same, and I told him so, but John, John is a perfectionist and would have none of it. Go big or go home, John used to say. He loved that phrase. He also liked, I'm getting too old for this <laughs> And also, did I do that? <laughs> My years of working with John were wonderful, full of excitement, fear, physical distress, and laughter. John is loyal. You know, friendship isn't something he half is like acting. <laughs> Sorry. You know, or gives up on quickly, like directing. I, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> it is really crazy to me, though, that he's my buddy. Like, I, I seriously don't know if we're really friends or this is like a make-a-wish type thing. <laughs> you know? Like, are you like my boy or just like kind of concerned? Uh... John, you know this, but you are like a like a small big brother to me. <laughs> you have given me so much wisdom to navigate so much in my life. You gave me advice during the Me Too movement and more recently during the Stop Asian Hate movement. And I will always, always be grateful for your friendship. So in 2015, John announced he was leaving The Daily Show. He walked away from the desk and the suits by Canali in order to pursue his dream of dressing like a maintenance worker for the rest of his life. <laughs> John, I know that you left the show for many reasons, but a big part of it was to spend more time with your family and experience more that life has to offer. But then last year, John decided to go back to work. Yeah. As it turns out, after spending more time with his family, John decided to spend less time with his family. Oh, good, good, good. Come on. Come on. Come on. So good. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs>